pirates stalked the seas again, seizing ships and holding cargoes and crews hostage. Strange as it seems, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps were forged over two centuries ago to fight pirates. For hundreds of years, the Barbary pirates, or Corsairs, terrorized the Mediterranean Sea. They sailed from ports along the North African coast, taking their name from the Barbary states of Tripoli, Tunis, Algiers, and Morocco. The Muslim pirates sided with the Ottoman Turks against Christian Europe. They preyed on merchant vessels, attacking ships and imprisoning their crews. If no one ransomed captive sailors, the corsairs enslaved them at hard labor. Barbary pirates raided as far away as England and Iceland. Sometimes European governments fought the pirates. More often, they paid them bribes, called tribute, to leave their ships alone. But across the Atlantic, a new nation was forming that would challenge the Barbary Corsairs. After Americans threw off British rule, their merchant ships no longer had Royal Navy protection. The Corsairs began to prey on American vessels bound for Mediterranean ports. For the new nation to survive, its goods had to reach market. The U.S. had to protect its commercial fleet. Fresh from British occupation, Americans distrusted the idea of a national military. Many of the Founding Fathers wanted a navy only strong enough to protect American shores. With few warships, the U.S. simply couldn't fight the pirates. In 1784, Congress agreed to spend $80,000 to bribe the Barbary Corsairs. To make the deal, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams sailed to England. In London, the envoys asked Tripoli's ambassador what gave the Barbary states the right to seize American ships and crews. It was the duty of all believers to make war against the unbelievers, the ambassador replied. Any Muslim slain in battle was promised them that payments to Tripoli would guarantee safe passage. So America, too, paid tribute. The Corsairs released American captives and agreed to let American ships be. But the attacks continued. As Americans began to lose patience, their leaders debated what to do. Jefferson argued for a stronger navy. It will be more easy to raise ships and men to fight these pirates into reason, he wrote, than money to bribe them. John Adams disagreed. We ought not fight them at all, he said, unless we determine to fight them forever. America resisted a military buildup until bribes to the pirates grew to almost 20% of the national budget. And still American sailors suffered in Barbary prisons. The country's outlook hardened. Congress decided America needed a force that could defend its trade on the world's oceans. In 1794, President George Washington authorized construction of six frigates, long-range attack vessels, fast and well-armed. Each would carry U.S. Marines, a force modeled on British troops stationed aboard warships. Now America would have a fighting navy. In 1801, Jefferson became president. Tripoli immediately tested him. Its ruler, Pasha Yusuf Karamanli demanded more tribute. When Jefferson refused, the Pasha declared war. Only Congress could send Americans into combat. But on his own, President Jefferson ordered U.S. warships to the Mediterranean. After the frigate sailed, he revealed what he'd done. The style of the demand admitted but one answer, Jefferson told Congress. I sent a small squadron of frigates into the Mediterranean. At first, the U.S. Navy fared badly. Corsairs took the USS Philadelphia, imprisoning her crew and sailing the captured frigate to Tripoli. At home, critics savaged Jefferson's foreign adventure. He stayed the course. 
A turning point came in 1804. In a night raid led by Lieutenant Stephen Decatur, Navy commandos blew up Philadelphia. U.S. warships bombarded Tripoli, wrecking her fortifications. Still, Karamanli refused to release his American captives. After a year of fruitless negotiation, the U.S. took action again. William Eaton, American consul to Tunis, assembled a small force of Marines and mercenaries. In April 1805, Eaton marched his troops from Egypt across 500 miles of desert to catch the Pasha by surprise. The Marines recruited the Pasha's enemies, including his brother, then invaded Tripoli. To stay in power, Pasha Yusuf signed a treaty releasing American hostages and promising to end attacks on American ships. The hard line seemed to work. Jefferson told Congress, the states on the Barbary Coast seem generally disposed at present to respect our peace and friendship. But the Corsairs had not ended their attacks. And in 1815, Commodore Stephen Decatur led American fighting men to victory in a second war against the Barbary pirates. This time, the raids stopped for good. The pirate kingdoms were beaten, and a new maritime power had emerged. President James Madison declared, as peace is better than war, war is better than tribute. The United States, while they wish for war with no nation, will buy peace with none. Today's pirates terrorize the seas as the Barbary Corsairs did long ago. With modern weapons and speedboats, they take prizes as large as oil tankers, demanding millions to ransom cargo and crews. Somali outlaws have made the seas off the Horn of Africa the most dangerous in the world, waters through which 30% of the world's oil must pass to reach market. To stop the attacks, a coalition that includes the United States has formed an international task force to patrol the area. And two centuries after American sailors and Marines first made their name fighting the Barbary Corsairs, they face a new generation of pirates on the high seas. Strange as it seems, 